Well, good morning, Compassion. Aren't you glad to be in the house of the Lord today? Amen. Well, as you see on the screen, we're only a month out from Easter. I am so excited. What we want you to do is help us do something. We know that you've got some friends or family members, co-workers or neighbors that, well, they don't know Jesus. They have not met him as Lord and Savior. Well, on this special day, Easter, it's one of those days that if you invite someone and they don't go to church or uh, they don't know Jesus, they'll come that day. They have to. It's Easter. That's just the way it is. So on April the 4th, what we want you to do is make sure you invite someone to come and to be a part of our Easter service. We're doing something called the Tale of Two Gardens. The Tale of Two Gardens. You don't want to miss it. Our stage will be completely de decorated. Our hallways is going to be so exciting. Our kids and all of our services will be having Easter egg hunts back in the children's apartment. They're going to have so much fun. And just to make sure, just to make sure that we've got enough services for you to invite your friends, we're going to have seven Easter services. Seven Easter services. It'll actually begin on the first, that Thursday night. We'll actually have an Easter service that night. Then on Saturday, we'll have two services at 4 and 6. And then that Sunday morning, we'll have a service at 8 30, 10 o'clock, 11 30, and 1 p.m. Now, we're doing that because we, we know that we're going to be full and we know that we're going to be packed. And so we want to make sure that we have enough services for you to invite your friends and family to come. Hey, do us a favor. Maybe come on Sunday, but maybe invite a friend that you know that works on Sundays. Invite them to come to Saturday night or Thursday night with you so that you can bring them. And maybe, just maybe, because of your simple invite, they'll give their hearts and lives to Christ and you because of your invite, have changed someone's eternal destination. So do me a favor. There's a card there in your seat. And there's a place for five names. And what we want you to do is between now and Easter, we want you to write down five names of individuals, co-workers, neighbors, friends, family members, that you know don't go to church or maybe are lost. And you're going to pray for them and then invite them to come to church. See, the prayer is the preparation. The prayer is preparing their heart, that their heart be tenderized, that when you do invite, that they will accept and they will come. And praise be to God, we're believing on that day that they will give their hearts and lives to Christ Jesus. Can you do that for us? So again, a month away, our weekend services for Easter is going to be amazing and make sure you invite some individuals to come and to be a part of that. How many of you like liars? I don't think anybody does. There's something built inside of me that I don't do very well with liars or boasters, people that kind of stretch the truth. Do, do, you, do you know of somebody? I, I think right now in your mind as I say that, Someone is coming to your mind. Someone that maybe is a co-worker, a neighbor, a friend, maybe someone in school you remember, that they just couldn't quite tell the truth. Or if they did, it was always boasted or made bigger than it was. I don't think any of us like liars. I don't think any of us like individuals that don't tell the truth. We start a new sermon series today called Liar, Lunatic, or Lord? Which one was he? Was he a liar? The, I guess the greatest con man of all times. Was he a lunatic? Just plumb out of his mind to actually claim to be God himself, the son of the living God. Was he crazy? Or maybe, just maybe, was he actually who he claimed to be and was he Lord? We actually get this concept from C.S. Lewis. Uh, C.S. Lewis says, I am trying here to prevent anyone saying that really foolish thing that people often say about Jesus. 
I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I do not accept him as his claim to be God. C.S. Lewis went on to say, that is the one thing we must not say. A man who was merely a man and said all sorts of things, Jesus said, would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic or on the level with man who says he is a poached egg or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make a choice. And that's what we want to do during this sermon series. We want to make a choice. You must make a choice. Either this man was and is the Son of God or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool. You can spit on him and kill him as a demon. Or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come with pre perceived ideas, nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He was not left open to us. He did not intend to. No, it seems to me obvious that he was neither a lunatic nor a friend, a, a, friend, a constant, however strange or terrified or unlikely it may seem. I've accepted the view that he was and is God. See, C.S. Lewis, the great theologian, came to a realization one day. A lot of people wanted to claim that Jesus wasn't God, but yet was a great moral teacher. And he said, you can either call him God, you can either call him crazy, or you can call him a liar. But you cannot say that he was a good moral teacher, but yet still claim to be the Son of God. Because the very claim to be the Son of God would nullify him being a great moral man. So for the next three weeks, we'll begin to talk about this, discuss it, debate it, and come to the realization that C.S. Lewis did, and that was either he was God or wasn't God, but there was no in-between. And let me say this today. My sermon will not just be based on the idea that whether you believe he is the Son of God. I would dare to say that most of you here do believe that even if you have not accepted him as Lord of your life. Because being here today, you most likely have come to some realization that who Jesus says he was is who Jesus says he is, and he is the Son of God. But what I want to do today is go a step further. That if Jesus is who he says he is, then all, all, every bit, not one single a lie, that every bit of the word of God that he said, he wrote, that he spoke, must be true. And that everything that God claimed, that everything that Jesus said in the word of God must be truth. And if it must be truth, if we believe him to be Lord and not a liar, then we must live and follow every word that he has spoken in the Bible and in the word of God. I want to read to you today out of John chapter 8. In John chapter 8 verse 54 it says, Jesus replied, If I glorify myself, it means nothing. My Father, whom you claim as your God, is the one who glorifies me. Though you do not know him, I know him. If I said I did not, I would be a liar like you. But I do know him and obey, listen to this, obey his Word. Let's pray. 
Lord, we thank you for the word that we're about to receive. I pray right now that every heart and every mind will be open, God, to receive, Lord, what you've got in store. And Lord, today not one, not one would leave this house the same way that they came. But they would come to believe that the word of God is honest and true and forthright. And that God, if we would live by that word, oh, how blessed we could be. In Jesus' mighty name, amen and amen. If you look at this part right here, you know, there are some parts that you really begin to see a little bit of uh, Jesus' sense of humor. I would even go as far to say sarcasm. That as you listen to this, I love what he says. Jesus replied, if I glorify myself, my glory means nothing. My father, whom you claim, here he goes, he, he kind of takes a dig. And the Pharisees here, he takes this little dig and he says, my father, whom you claim, is your God. In other words, he stops there and he says, you may claim it, but you don't live it. You may claim it, but he's really not the Lord of your life. You may claim it, but if you did, you wouldn't act the way you act. Go on, listen to what he says. Is the one who glorifies me, though you do not know him. Then he takes another dig at them. And the Pharisees, he says, if you knew him, which you don't, I do. Have, have you ever come, have someone come to you and they're a know-it-all? One is I don't like liars. I don't do well with liars. Even worse than a liar, if I can be honest with you, I don't do well with know-it-alls. I, I don't do well with people that when you go to talk about a subject, I, I kind of call it the Cliff from uh, Cheers. Remember Cliff from Cheers would sit at the bar? And no matter what light you talk, no matter what topic you talked about, it could be lights. He would sit on the bar and go, well, right now, the greatest illumination quality out there is quality CCPPPT24. You know, that's how Cliff was. You know, half the time he was making up what he said, but it sounded good to him. See, first God begins to address the fact that one is they don't know God. If they did know God, then they don't really know God. And he begins to address their know-it-alls. See, I, I just don't, I don't do well with know-it-alls. I'm, I'm always of the belief that you should be open-minded to receive what's being taught you. I, I, I'm always of the belief that you should be open-minded to receive critique and criticism because if not, you're, you're unteachable, you're a know-it-all, and you'll never get any better. He goes on to say this, if I said I did not, I would be a liar. See, we address the liar right there. He says, I'm not a liar. I'm not a liar. But I do know him and obey his word. If we begin to look at the word and we begin to study the word, what does he say about lying? Is Jesus a liar? We know that it says in Titus chapter 1, verse 2, in the hope of eternal life, which God, who does not lie, Promise before the beginning of time. Number one is, the Bible says that God does not lie. Now, when you go to Hebrews chapter 6, verse 18, and it says, God did this so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie. First, we know we hear that God doesn't lie. The second thing we hear is that God cannot lie. It's impossible. I don't know if some of you knew that, there are some things God cannot do. We've always been told that God can do all things. Actually, there are some things God cannot do. One of those is God cannot lie. It's impossible. Has anybody ever seen the movie Liar, Liar? That movie cracks me up. Because in, in, in that movie, if you remember, he's trying to lie and he can't lie. And every, no matter what he does, he's like, no matter what he does, he can't lie. Well, see, that's how God is. I even like the part when he's trying to write a lie. 
He, maybe he's got that, 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 that pen and that pad, and he's trying to write a lie, and the pen goes crazy, and he can't write a lie. It's the same thing with God in his word. If he cannot lie, he cannot write a lie, so every word in the Bible is truth. Now listen to this. Then in Proverbs chapter 6, verse 16, it says, There are six things the Lord hates, seven that are detestable to him. Haughty eyes, not haughty eyes. If you got haughty eyes, you, you, God doesn't hate you because you got pretty eyes. Haughty eyes and a lying tongue. So one, we find out God doesn't lie. Second, we find out that God cannot lie. It's impossible. Third, we find out that God actually hates Lying. We've all been told God doesn't hate. Actually, we do find there are things that God hates. One of those being lying. See, in fact, that's why I tell people if you struggle with lying and being honest, listen, God hates lying. Why? Because God knows what lying does. It only opens the door for worse things down the road. So the Bible tells us that God actually hates lying. In fact, in Proverbs 12, 22, it says this, the Lord detests Lying lips. So what do we know today? As C.S. Lewis began to write, he said either he's the greatest liar, a lunatic, or Lord. We begin to find out that he is not a liar. That Jesus was who he said he was. He was the son of the living God. That when he died on the cross, he did die, not because of a crime, but he died to be the sacrificial lamb that through the shedding of his blood, we would have forgiveness of our sins. Why? Because to go to God, to have a relationship with God, there has to be something that covers or either washes away our sins. Before Jesus, you had to sacrifice a lamb every year to cover your sins. The problem with covering your sins were they were what? Still there. But with Jesus and what he did on the cross and on Calvary, when he died upon the cross, it washed away all of our sins, made us a new creature and a new creation before God. And our sins aren't there anymore. They're washed away and we're made fresh and we are made new. So today, as we begin to talk about it, whether he's a liar or a lunatic, we begin to read and and study what it means to trust in God's word, believe who he is, and what even Jesus himself said about being a liar. It says in John chapter 8, verse 43, because you are unable to hear what I say, you belong to your father, the devil and want to carry out your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, but there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language. To me, that is hilarious. Right there, when Jesus says that, your father, the devil, when he lies, he only speaks his language. And what is his language? A liar. In other words, let me tell you this today. There are many times that what is going on in your mind is not you. It is not God. It is the devil lying to you. You're not good enough. You'll never amount to anything. This is the best it'll ever get. You're not going to get that job. You're not going to be blessed with a great spouse. You're not going to do this and you're not going to do that. Can I tell you that is the devil speaking his language in your life and he is a liar. Amen? I want you to write this down. Number one, who you believe in decides who you belong to. Who you believe in decides who you belong to. As we just listened there in John 8 verse 43, see, we need to realize who you believe in is who you listen to. Who you believe in is who you listen to. In other words, if I believe that Jesus is not a liar, but he actually is Lord, then I belong to him. And if I belong to him, when he talks, I listen. When he speaks, my ears open. What he says to do, I do. Because I know that he's not lying. I know that he has my best interests at heart. See, many times what happens is we can't hear the Lord. 
Not because we don't believe he's the son of God. Not because we don't believe he died on the cross. But for some reason, we've come to believe the lie of the devil that if we don't have control over our life, then our life will be a mess. Can I tell you, God's plan and purpose for your life is better than you can ever imagine. And what his word spoke is true. The truth you hold on to eventually gets a hold on you. See, the truth you hold on to will eventually get a hold on to you. Listen to John 8, 44. You belong to your father. I just want to laugh at that. You belong to your father, the devil. Have you ever been with somebody when they call somebody out? For a moment you feel bad, but they're that know-it-all person that you can't correct or you can't, that they, they won't, they're not teachable, and somebody finally calls them out, and, and you're like, Pfft. See, those standing around felt the same way. Finally, someone called these people out and said who they are. He said, you belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desires. Remember, who you believe in is who you belong to. And you want to carry out your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning. Listen to this. Not holding to the truth. For there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. See, you have to decide that you believe everything in the word of God about God. He's not a liar. He, listen, and in fact, let me say this. If you believe 98% of the Bible, but don't believe the other 2%, you might as well throw out the other 98%. If Jesus or God in the scripture lied once, then everything else is nullified. It's not correct. It's not right. So when we say that, and then the Bible says, don't do this or do this, and we don't do that or don't or don't do that, what happens in our life is we tell God he's a liar. Who you belong to decides what you belong to. If I'm telling the truth, why don't you believe me? Whoever belongs to God hears what God says. The reason you don't hear what you do because you do not belong to God. See, in other words, if you've got a profound relationship with God, if you belong to him, everything that God has for you will come in your life. Everything that God speaks. Listen, if you can't hear the Lord, it's not because God isn't speaking. It's probably because you've got too many lies in your ears that you're not hearing what God is saying. My wife did that to me the other day. She was talking. I was doing something and she was talking. And she said, did you hear what I said? I said, yes, honey, I did. She goes, what did I say? Well, I'm not going to take time to repeat it back to you. Well, I didn't hear what she said. So I lied. I was a liar. I had to repent. All right, honey, I didn't hear what you said. I'm, I'm sorry. Say it again. I'm not saying it again. Do you know that's how God feels sometimes? He has told you 5,677 times what to do. And you keep getting on your knees and saying, God, I'm just waiting to hear your voice. I wonder sometimes if the Father looks over to the Son and the Holy Spirit like, what must I do? I've said over and over and over again. I don't know why I just went to a British accent right then. Number two, who you believe God is doesn't change who God is. It only changes who God is to you. You need to hear that. Who you believe God is doesn't change who God is. It only changes who God is to you. Listen to what he says right here. The Jews answered him, aren't we right in saying that you are Samaritan and demon possessed? I'm not demon possessed by, I'm not possessed by a demon, Jesus. In fact, I almost see Jesus almost laughs a little bit. I started laughing right then. I I almost think Jesus went, (laughs) I'm not demon possessed. But I honor my father, and you dishonor me. I am not seeking glory for myself, but there is one who seeks it, and he is the judge. Very truly I tell you, whoever obeys my word will never see death. As this they exclaim, 
Now we know that you are demon-possessed. Abraham died, and so did the prophets. Yet you say that whatever, whoever obeys your word will never taste death. Are you greater than our father Abraham? He died, and so did the prophets. Listen to this. Who do you think you are? A greater question would be this. Who do you think he is? Who do you think that he is? See, in their, in their rambling, in their argument, in their being mad and frustrated, they begin to say who he is. Listen, I know you're not saying Jesus is the devil or he's demon-possessed, but sometimes this is what you do say, Jesus isn't good enough. Jesus isn't powerful enough. Jesus doesn't love me enough. Jesus can't get me out of this bad situation. Jesus can't fix my marriage. Jesus can't touch my finances. See, you need to realize that you, although God never changes and will never change, but listen, God is who he is. But you need to realize you can make who God is in your own life because you believe lies and don't believe the truth. The Bible says that in Corinthians that the promises of God are yes and amen. See, it's not enough just to believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of the living God. You must also believe everything he spoke and everything he said and everything he proclaimed. You need to understand that he can heal your marriage. He can touch your body. You need to understand that he can bring joy in the middle of the storm. You need to understand that he can bring peace when everything is in chaos. You need to understand that where you are, you are lacking, God can always give more than enough. Many times things in our lives are shaped by how we see who God is and believe who God is. So years ago, I had a lady in our church. She actually started coming to our church. She was a, actually a stripper. And started coming to our church and uh, loved our church. In fact, actually started growing our church. And one day at the altar, we were praying over her. And as we're praying over her, I was talking about the Heavenly Father. And after service, she came to me. She said, Pastor, if I can be honest with you, when you use the word Father, it's not a good connotation to me. She talked about how her father, her stepfather, had molested her almost all her life, how he had treated her and what he had done to her. It was terrible, and my heart cried. But see, in her mind, she had perceived the word Father as a bad thing. And it took a while for us, me and my wife, to pour into that woman to make her understand that don't you see your heavenly father by what your earthly father did to you. Your heavenly father loves you and wants the best for you and desires to do things in your life that you never thought possible. Your heavenly father would never hurt you and would never do anything to bring down a curse on you. He wants to bless you. But see, our belief on who God is has a dramatic impact on the future of our lives. It says in John 8, 49, but I honor my Father, and you dishonor me. I am not seeking glory for myself, but there is one who seeks it, and he is the judge. Very truly, I tell you, whoever obeys, listen to that, See, it's not just about your belief that Jesus is who he says. It's about your belief that what he said to do, you do. Because if you obey, listen to this, my word, obey, my word will never see death. My word will never see death. In other words, what he says is this. If you will obey me, what I've spoken over your life is life. And it will never bring death. If you will obey me, what I've spoken over your life will bring blessings and honor and joy and peace. Even in the middle of your, your, your storms that are raging all around you. John 8, 48 says, At this they exclaimed, Now we know that you're demon-possessed. Abraham died and so did the prophets. What are, they, what are they saying right there? Experience. Our experience is that the prophets died and they all died. 
So can I tell you one of the greatest liars in your life will be experienced? My life has always been bad. My life has always been terrible. This happened once, so that means it's going to happen again. But see, God's Word is truth, not your experience. See, some of you sit in this service today, I want you to hear me when I say this. Your experiences of the past are defeating your tomorrows. Because you keep listening to the lies. People are against me. People won't love me. God can't use me. I've got to fend for myself. I've got to take care of my family. I've got to be the one. And the problem is your lies keep bringing the same curse over and over and over in your life. Here's the last thing. What are you picking up because of what you're not believing in? What are you picking up because of what you're not believing in? In John 8, 54, he says this, Jesus replied, If I glorify myself, glory means nothing. My Father whom you claim as your God is the one who glorifies me. Though you do not know him, I know him. If I said I did not, I would be a liar. See, many times what we pick up through our journey of life is of experience, failures, mistakes. They begin to form our idea of who God is. See, many times I thought Jesus, see, Jesus had to fight it. Remember the story when they came in the garden to arrest him? Remember Peter's first reaction to get mad, to get upset, pulled out his sword and cut off the ear of the soldier? But yet Jesus, who's about to be arrested, Jesus, who's about to be crucified, he tells Peter, no, that's not the right reaction. And not only did he do that, he picked up, all I can imagine is he reached down and picked up the ear of that soldier off the ground, put it back on the soldier, and he healed him right then. Jesus says, Peter, you've lived your life with anger and bitterness. Peter, you've lived your life thinking you've got to defend yourself. Peter, I'm telling you, if God is for you, who in this world can ever be against you? Peter, I'm telling you, stop picking up things along the journey of life that hurt you instead of help you. Stop believing the lies that are telling you that you're not good enough. Stop believing the lies that tell you that this is the best it will ever be. Peter, you've got to stop picking up things and you've got to start believing in me. Verse 59, it says, John 8, 59, it says, Very truly I tell you, Jesus answered, Before Abraham was born, I am. See, the next few weeks, starting next week, I'll start talking about the, the I ams. If we're going to determine today that it's not a liar, then for the next two weeks we'll talk about who the I am is. See, remember, Jesus said to Peter, who do they say that I am? He goes on to say, Elijah. But I love Jesus' next response. See, Jesus really didn't care who they said he was. Do you know that? What Jesus was doing to Peter was, Peter, have you believed him? Have what they've been saying about who I am, is it having an impact on you? See, Jesus actually was preparing Peter. Because Peter, in a short time, you're going to deny me three times. Because of what they begin to say, you'll begin to believe and you'll start denying. 
But he said, Peter, who do you say that I am? See, either you believe that Jesus is who he says he is, the Son of the living God, the Redeemer of the world, the Savior of the universe, the lover of your soul. But see, it's not enough just to believe who Jesus is. You've got to believe what Jesus can do. If you believe all that it says, then why are you still bitter and have unforgiveness in your heart? If you do believe his word, why do you keep living in fear and doubt? If you believe what he says, why do you keep thinking your marriage is over? Or you won't get out of this financial problem. If you believe who he is, and he's not a liar, but he is Lord, then you believe everything about who Jesus is, that he will love you no matter what. If you believe who he is, why is it when you do mess up, you don't think he'll take you back? Or receive you as his own. He didn't accept you and give you salvation because of what you did. He gave you salvation because of what he did. See, that's another thing I don't do very well with is judgmental Christians. I don't. Never get too far from your grace that you get, don't give grace. I'll close with this. Yesterday, I was at a retreat for pastors. And as I'm at this retreat, there's a gentleman getting up and he's giving the devotion. He actually pastors a church. And if I can be honest, when he was first offered that church, we in essence told him not to take it. He didn't have the ability. He wasn't gifted enough. That young man got up and spoke yesterday, and I almost cried listening to his sermon because he proved us to be a liar. He proved us wrong. See, I want some of you to prove the devil wrong. And what he's been saying about your life and your abilities and your lack. I want you to prove the devil that he's a liar, not God. Because if God said it about you, then God's going to do it. If God proclaimed it about you, then it's going to happen. That you're going to start believing that he is Lord, not a liar. And what he said about you is true. And I shall believe it. And I shall walk in it. And I shall have faith. My God is not a liar, but my God is a prophet in my life, speaking of my future and my tomorrow, and I will grasp a hold of it, and I will believe. He isn't a liar about what he did for you. He isn't a liar about what he can do for you. He isn't a liar about what he can do in you. And he isn't lying about what he can do through you. He is not a liar, but a truth teller. And he's speaking prophecy over your tomorrow, if you shall walk in it. Will you stand with me?